And hello everyone and welcome to our December NHSR webinar, the R Workflow. Uh, my name's Lynn Howard and today I'm pleased to be joined by Ryan Johnson, who is Customer Success Representative at POSIT, formerly known as R Studio. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available later um, on the NHSR community website and YouTube page. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, and Brian will either be uh, answer them as we're going along or at the end of the session, uh, depending on uh, the amount of detail that is needed to answer them. Um, if you think of any questions after the webinar, please do feel free to contact us uh, either using our Twitter page or via our very popular Slack channel, uh, both of which again will be shared in the chat or you can find the links on the community web page and community members will be more than happy to help you. Um, at the end of the webinar, we're going to use Mentimeter to gather feedback uh, and that link again will be shared in the chat. Please do let us know how you found the session and we do appreciate your feedback, so thank you. So with more ado, over to you, Ryan. Great, thank you, Linda, for the great intro. Uh, and apologies, everyone, for starting a little bit late. Um, hopefully we'll be able to play some catch up here and still sneak it in uh, within the hour. Uh, but again, if we have questions as we go through, just feel free to pop those into the, the Teams chat. So today's session is going to be on the R workflow. Uh, and I know we're going to be collecting some uh, survey data afterwards. I'd be really uh, interested to hear what everyone thinks about this work, uh, this presentation, because it's brand new. Um, I actually had a previous version of it, but I didn't really like it that much. So I redid it especially, uh, you know, for this presentation. So certainly would appreciate any feedback. It's going to be a bit of a whirlwind. So we're going to talk about a lot of different things, but the whole goal is just to expose you to a bunch of different topics tools that you can use to improve your workflows in R. Um, I'm going to go ahead and in the chat, I'll pop this link here. So if anyone wants to follow along with the code, let me just grab the chat here. All right, so the link to um, all the code I'll be describing today will be here on GitHub, or at least you know, a pretty close uh, variant of the code. All right, so we're going to dive right into it. Uh, I don't want to waste any time with any introductory stuff. We're just going to dive right into the typical workflow. And so this presentation will be focusing in on R, but I would wager a guess that most workflows um, are going to follow this trajectory where you typically start with some data set that could be a raw data set, um, something like that, and then you're going to be analyzing it. Now, anal the analysis could be cleaning it up, it could be performing some machine learning, you know, what have you, and then ultimately taking all those insights from the analysis and reporting it. And that report could look very different, whether it's a web application or a static uh, report. So focusing in just on the data to start, so with this workflow, there's a lot of questions about the data. Not all data is the same. So what exactly is the data? What format, you know, is it a CSV file, a text file? Is it gonna be some massive, you know, compressed file? Is it structured or is it unstructured data? Next question is kind of where is the data? Is this going to be a public data set? So something that really anyone in the world can access or is it gonna be private just to you or your group or your team? Are you working with local data? So something that's on your physical computer or server, or do you have to access this data in a remote location on some other server in the cloud? Is it in a database? Um, is it, you know, again, structured data and a nice clean data set where you can just make calls to that database? Or is it like a data lake versus kind of everything just kind of thrown into this data lake? Maybe it's in an API. So you have to make specific calls to an API to get the exact data that you want. How big is the data? Is this going to be a small data set that can be easily consumed by your analyses? Or is this going to be some massive data set where you're gonna to have to think about some clever ways to, to deal with this huge data? And does the data change? Um, you know, there's a lot of different data sets out there. Some are static, you know, today, it'll be the same data set tomorrow, a year from now, 10 years from now, or these could be very fluid. So think about, for example, COVID data. And this changes basically every single day. So you have to think about stuff like that. 
So the next in the workflow, you have your analyses, and this really can vary depending on what your goals are. So what type of analysis you're running? Are you doing that typical extract, transform, load, or ETL workflow where you're pulling in some raw data, doing something to it, and then loading it back to like a database or somewhere else? Are you doing some normal cleaning, modeling, simulation data, visualizations, lots of different analyses. But a really important thing to think about is the compute power. Right? Is this something that you can run on your individual laptop, you know, maybe just pumping out some quick plots, or is this going to be some massive, you know, simulations or on multiple nodes, huge parallel processing jobs? These are things you have to think about as well. And then finally, we have reporting, probably the most fun part about the, the workflow. And this is ultimately how you're going to be informing the folks that you know want to consume the analyses you just performed. So when you report something, you know, how is that report going to be delivered? Is it going to be hosted on a server, such as something like Posit Connect, which we'll talk about? Is this going to be something you email folks? You know, a lot of a lot of team members just love to live in their inbox, and sometimes you want to deliver those insights via an email. Or maybe you make your findings or your models accessible via an API, which we'll also we'll talk a little bit about today. Similar to the data set, you know, is the report, is it also need to be updated? Is this going to be a single report where again, it's gonna have insights that's kind of a one and done, that insights won't change over time, or do you need to constantly refresh uh, this report? And then finally, what type of report are you going to be delivering? You know, static reports, things like R Markdown, Corto, Jupyter Notebook. These are all what we consider static reports. But then we also have web apps. And the web app that we're going to focus in on today is going to be built using the Shiny framework, which I, I would wager a lot of folks on the lines are at least familiar with Shiny. Uh, but if not, that's okay. We're going to talk all about Shiny. So to keep things nice and simple, this is the application we're gonna be working with today. And hopefully this application looks familiar because this is the built-in Shiny application that comes with our studio, all right? And so what we're going to do here in a second is we're going to create the Shiny application and just walk through all the components to make sure everyone is familiar with this. So if you wanna follow along, if you have an instance of our studio open, whether that be in Workbench or on your desktop or in Posit Cloud, for example, feel free to follow along with this portion or you can just sit back and relax, take, take it all in. So I'm gonna be accessing our studio from within Posit Workbench, which is one of our professional tools. So this is a server-based implementation of the RStudio IDE. So I'm gonna click on Workbench. All right, so we have this welcome screen here and I'm gonna go ahead and open up a brand new session. All right, so I click on new session. I have the option of all these various IDEs so VS Code, Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, or our studio. We're gonna stick with that. And we'll just keep everything else the same. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this session and give it a few seconds to kick on and it should plop us right into that R Studio session. And while we go through this workflow, I'm also gonna be touching upon some other best practices for when you're working on projects right, within uh, our studio or really kind of any uh, environment. And one of those best practices, so here we are within the RStudio IDE, we have a console on the left-hand side, our environments pane in the top right, and our file browser down here at the bottom. So a good practice is anytime you're going to be working with a new project, or maybe you already have a pre-existing project, is always to leverage something known as RStudio projects. Now, if you look in the top right corner here, you can see project none. And we want to change that. We're going to make this a new project, all right? Now, why would you want to create a project? It's just a great way to keep everything isolated within kind of a centralized environment, all right? So I don't need the scripts, the plots, the reports, the packages, all that stuff is all going to be contained within a single project. So it keeps one project very isolated from another project so you don't get any crosstalk and cause any conflicts. So let's go ahead and create a new project here within our studio. We get a few options here. We can start with a brand new directory, which is what we're gonna do. You can also, if you have some scripts and have some data already in a directory somewhere on your file system, you can create a project within that directory, or you can pull in a new project from uh, version control, something like GitHub, for example. But I'm gonna stick with a brand new directory. We're really gonna start fresh here. Select new project. I'm just gonna call this NHS R workflow. You do get the option to create a Git repository. So if you're going to be using 
version control, which we would highly recommend. You'd want to click this box. But for this demo, we're going to leave it unchecked. And then you have the option to use RN, which is a really great tool for keeping track of all those packages within this project. And again, it's highly recommend you do that as well, but we're gonna leave it unchecked just for simplicity's sake uh, for this demo. And we'll hit create project. So anytime you create a new RStudio project, it's going to open up a brand new RStudio session. So whether you're within Workbench or running RStudio locally. All right. So now we're in a fresh RStudio project. And I know that because if you look in the top right corner here, you see NHS, our workflow. Um, and you can also see my current path, which is listed right here in the kind of top left. You can see I'm within that working directory. So this is my new home directory for this project. And this is where we're going to put all of our scripts analyses for this R workflow. All right. So we've created this fresh RStudio project. Let's go ahead and create that shiny application. So in the top left corner, you'll see this little green plus. This is a, a great way to just get started with various scripts, APIs, applications, Quarto documents, which we'll talk about here. You can also see Shiny Web App. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this. And I'm just gonna call this Test App NHS, and we'll hit Create. All right, so if you're not familiar with Shiny, this is a Shiny application over here on the left-hand side. It, first and foremost, it is R code. All right, so that's something that we believe very heavily at, at Posit is that all data science should be code-based. Uh, Shiny is no exception here. All right, so when you have a Shiny application open within our studio, you do get this additional button right here to run this application locally within our studio. So I can do that. And here we have the rendered Shiny application. So let me make my screen a little bit bigger. There we go. All right, so here is my rendered Shiny application. And I can slide this bar to the left, I can slide it to the right, and you can see it changes the number of bins in our histogram. All right, so very simple Shiny application, but it does demonstrate the power of Shiny, the ability to interact with your data and kind of get these live results. So if we have that application running, let me actually re-render it here just so we can kind of see what's going on as we go through some of the code. But because we're going to be leveraging this Shiny application for this demo, I want to make sure that we have a firm understanding of all the code that's going on behind the scenes. So I'm just going to quickly run through it. We're going to start right here at line 10. Right? Everything above line 10 are just comments to the authors. So these aren't actually executed. You can see line 10, we're going to load the Shiny package. Make my screen a little bit bigger. There we go. After we do that, we define the user interface. All right? Now for this demo, for this session, we're not gonna be really focusing in on the user interface, but I just wanna quickly go over it so you know what's going on. All right, so we're gonna leverage a fluid page and a sidebar layout format. So the first thing we have right here is our title panel. So you can see that's reflected right here. And then we only have one input and that's gonna be the slider input. We're giving it the input ID of bins. And then everything else is just going to be unique to the slider input, like the name, so number of bins, the min, max, and the default value, which you can see is set to 30. And then we have our main panel, which you can see is showing our histogram, all right? And so that's gonna be shown right here as this plot. Again, for the most part, we're not going to be focusing on the user interface, but now you know a little bit more about it, but we are gonna spend some time talking about the server. Server is where all the code that runs behind the scenes of your Shiny application lives. So we have a few things here. We're creating a plot, all right, we're saving it as this plot, which again gets sent to the user interface up here. And then within this render plot, we have some data. We're going to use a built in data set called the Faithful. Sorry to uh, interrupt you, Ryan. We'll um, your screen yeah. seems to be cut off on the left hand side. Okay, let me see if I can move it a little bit to. Does that help at all, or is it still? No, that's not moved. All right, what if I do? do, do, do... Yep, we can see everything yeah, now. Good. Okay, whoops, okay. Thank you. Gotcha. All right, so we'll just have to give it a little squish, but that's okay. All right, yeah, if anything like that happens again, definitely feel free to interrupt me. All right, so just running through again all the code in our server function. So we have our data set. This is the faithful geyser data set. We'll talk about this in detail. We're gonna save it to a variable called X. 
We have another line right here on line 41. This is really gonna be our analyses, which we'll talk more about in detail. And then we have the actual code to draw the histogram using this hist function. And that's pretty much it. Down here at the very bottom is just a call to that shiny app function to just run the shiny application. All right, so now that we have a little bit more of an understanding of what's going on behind the scenes of the shiny application, a hypothetical question for everyone here on the line, no need to answer it, just something to think about. Well, let's say your business or your company, whatever you're, you're building, it absolutely 100% depended on this application running you know, correctly, quickly. You know, would you be comfortable if your team, your company, depended or relied on this application that we just showed you? So this is something to think about. Now, I would make an argument that say, yes, sure. You know, I think this application is pretty good. And why is that? Because it's consistent. You know, the data doesn't change. And I'll, I'll show you um, what that data looks like here in a second. It's very simple. You know, it just has one input, one output, one data set. And it's pretty fast. So you saw as I slid the bar to the left and right, it responded pretty quickly. These are all, all characteristics of a good you know, production-ready shine application. But not all apps are going to be this simple. So when we talk about this specific application, what are we actually talking about? So we have a report, right? We, and this report is going to be a Shiny application. And within that Shiny application, so when we were going over that code, we had all the code for the analyses, and we had all the code that imports the data set. So everything's basically contained within the Shiny application. And that's totally fine. You know, for this application, because it's fast, because it's simple, because it's consistent, you don't need to change this application. So it's really important to know when and when you should, when you shouldn't over-engineer applications or any type of reporting for that matter. So a good rule of thumb is that, you know, don't over-engineer workflows if you don't need to. But like I mentioned in the last slide, you know, not all apps are going to be this simple. So it is important to know when to, not necessarily over-engineer, but to think about different ways to engineer your applications, your reports, so that you can scale accordingly. And we're gonna go ahead and start here with the data. So let me just get everyone up to speed on what exactly is this data. So looking again at our server function in our Shiny application, we're using something known as Faithful. All right, so this is a built-in data set to R. So when you download R onto your computer or server, the faithful data sets are already there for you. And it's just a good data set to play around with, try out some visualizations uh, for you to just test out. And specifically, we're going to be extracting the second column as a vector and saving it to the value of x. So this is what, uh, just kind of a snippet of what this data looks like. I'm just showing the first 14 columns, or rows, sorry. And we have two columns in this data set. You can see eruptions, which is the first column. And then the second one is this waiting column. And these correspond, at least in the first column, this is the amount of time in minutes, every time Old Faithful, which is a, a big geyser, uh, somewhere in the Western United States, uh, I think it's in Yosemite, every time it erupts, it takes that long in minutes. And then from time to the next eruption is shown in minutes over here in the second column. So as a reminder, we're gonna be extracting the second column as our data for this application. And I'm showing you that data right here. So this is the second column of the Faithful Geyser data set extracted as a vector. And you can see it's about a little over 270 numeric values in length. And that's it. It's a pretty simple data set. You can see the numbers right here. It all fits nicely onto the screen. But again, going back to that previous slide, what if this data changed every single day? Like maybe they just continue to add data every single time Old Faithful Geyser erupted. What if the data wasn't built into R? Maybe it was stored somewhere else and you needed to import it into your workflows. What if others wanted to sh share this data you know, with your other teammates? Like, sure, it's pretty easy when the data is built into R, but what about if it's not? And then what if this data was not this small? Maybe it was actually millions and millions of rows in length and hundreds of gigabytes in size. You know, That definitely kind of changes how you're going to approach this data set. So that brings us to our first workflow, all right? So rather than just simply having a data set built into the Shiny application, we're gonna take that data set 
and we're going to save it as something as a pin. Right? And this pin, we're going to pin it to something known as Posit Connect, which is one of our professional tools. This is our, our kind of our publishing platform, which we'll talk more about here in a second. But let's talk a little bit about pins. Maybe some of you have heard about it on the, on the call and maybe some of you haven't. And that's okay. But I think pins is a really underutilized tool which can help improve a lot of your workflows. So pins is an open source R package, just like Shiny, something that we've developed here at Posit. And what it allows you to do is publish or pin data, models, any other R object to a board, right? And that makes it really easy to share across projects and also with your colleagues. And so like I just mentioned, you can pin these objects to boards and these boards could be a variety of things, but for this workflow, we're gonna leverage Posit Connect as our board. So just like you take a piece of paper and pin it to a cork board, you can pin your data and pin it to a Connect board. And it really makes your data so you can easily update it, you can version it. So it just makes your data a little bit more flexible. So we're going to pin our data to Posit Connect, but we need an additional tool to basically house all the code in order to do this. And we're gonna leverage something known as Quarto. So Quarto is something we're really excited about. It's a brand new tool that we announced at our conference back in Ju July, I believe, June or July. And it's very similar to R Markdown. So if anyone on the call is familiar with R Markdown, you can basically consider it like R Markdown 2.0 but it's really tailored to scientific and technical publishing. And what's unique about it, as opposed to our markdown, is you can create these using whatever language you want. So you can use R, which is what we're gonna do, but you can use Python, Julia, Observable, um, and, and you can use whatever IDE you want as well. So we're gonna stick within the R Studio IDE, but you can also create Quarto documents using VS Code, Jupyter, or any other text editor. And similar to pins, you can also take Quarto documents and host them on Posit Connect and set them up for job scheduling, which is a really cool workflow and something we're all actually, uh, I'll talk about here in a second. All right, so what we're going to go ahead and do here is we're going to take our data set, that second column from the Gadget data set, and we're gonna pin it to Posit Connect. And we're gonna do that using Quarto. All right, so I'm going to come back here to the RStudio IDE. So we have our Shiny application. I'm going to go ahead and close out of this. And I'm going to open up a Quarto document. So you can see in these starter scripts, we have Quarto document. I'll go ahead and select this. I'm just going to say NHS pin data and hit create. And here is our Quarto document. And you can see by default, it's leveraging our visual editor mode, uh, which just makes working with these documents really nice and pretty. But you can also edit them in using source code, which looks much more like your typical R markdown. But we'll stick with visual because I, I do think it's nice to play around with. It does come kind of pre-built with some codes and text in there, but I'm just gonna go ahead and delete all of this so we can start fresh. All right, so let's go ahead and Take that faithful geyser data set and we're going to create a pin and pin it to our studio connect. So we're going to step through this a bit by bit. The first thing we need to do is load our packages, right? So I'm going to go ahead and insert an R code chunk here and I'm going to load the library pins package. So because we're taking this faithful geyser data set and pinning it, we need to make sure we have pins. I'm going to go ahead and run this and just make sure I have pins in my environment. Looks like I loaded just fine, but if it didn't, you just have to install that. All right, after that, we're gonna go ahead and filter and save our data. And I'll go ahead and have another R code chunk here. And we're going to, just like in our Shiny application, we're gonna save our data as an X variable. All right, and we're going to assign it to the faithful geyser data set, just the second column. All right, so I can run this and just make sure that looks good. You can see in my environment pane, I have X. I can run it down here. Yep, that all looks correct. So the goal now is we wanna take this data and we wanna pin it to our Studio Connect. All right, so that's gonna be the next section here, pin to posit connect. So I'm gonna go ahead and just copy a few things from that GitHub repository I shared in the chat. And the first thing here is our board. So I mentioned that pins, you need a place to actually pin your pins. In this example, we're gonna be using Posit Connect. And so I have the URL to our demo server of Posit Connect right here. All right, we call it Colorado. I've 
No idea why, this is what we call it. So this is the actual server of Posit Connect we're gonna be using. And you do need to supply a Connect API key just to, so that Connect knows who's pinning uh, this data set. So we're gonna use the pins board RS Connect function to uh, basically register this board. So I'll hit play here. And you can see connecting to our Studio Connect, we'll pause Connect, and that looks correct. All right, so we've now registered it, that's good. And now we're gonna go ahead and write the pin. And it's a very intuitive function called pin write. All we have to do is supply the board, all right? So we'll just leave that as board, the data set X, and then we can give a name as well, all right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and call it faithful geyser data, and that's it. So I'll go ahead and run that code chunk, and you can see, it's going to write as an RDS file, writing to pins, faithful geyser data. So that's it. Think of this as like saving it to like a Dropbox or an S3 bucket. We're just taking a data set and we're saving it to Posit Connect uh, so that others can use it or you could potentially use it in other workflows. Now I'm going to switch over to, to Posit Connect here. I'm just going to refresh here and show you what this pin looks like. All right, so here is that data set, that pin data set we just pinned. I can click on it. And it's not going to show you much, right? but what it does show you, which is really helpful, is it gives you the code so you can import this data set into another script or another workflow. So loading the pins, registering the board, instead of pin write, we can use pin read. All right? So we're going to use this here in a second, but this is what a pin looks like once it's hosted on Connect. Now, actually, let me go back to um, this uh, document really quick. So this is a Quarto document. Now this data set, it doesn't change. All right? Every time I run this command, it's gonna be the same data set. But again, think about what if your data changed every single day. And you might wanna rewrite this pin every single day so it's updated with that new data. And we can do that using Quarto with the help of Posit Connect. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this document. I'm gonna call it test uh, Quarto pin geyser. And I'm gonna hit save. Now, the first thing I want to do here is I want to publish this Quarto document to Posit Connect. Just like we published the pin, we're going to publish it to Connect. But we're going to use a kind of the canonical uh, publishing workflow. So we're going to click on this little blue button right here. And we want to publish this to our studio or Posit Connect. Publish document with the source code. So if you want to set it up for job scheduling, you do need to make sure you include the source code. It's going to ask, you know, what Connect server. So we're going to use that Colorado Connect, which I mentioned before. We can leave the title the same. We're just going to publish this single Quarto document, which is that QMD um, ending. We'll hit publish. So if you've never published anything to Connect before, that's pretty much it. Once I hit publish, R Studio takes care of the rest. It's going to capture my environment, so what packages I'm using, what versions of those packages, what version of R am I using. It sends all that information to Posit Connect. Connect reads it, replicates my environment, and then publishes this Quarto document. So let's give us a few more seconds to run. And then once it's done, it should automatically pop open and connect. And here we had that Quarto document now hosted on Posit Connect. And what I'll do first and foremost is I'm going to open this up to everyone here on the line. So I'm going to set the sharing settings to anyone, no login required, and hit save. I'm going to grab the URL here at the top, come back into the chat, and paste it here. So now everyone here on the line can see that Quarto document we just created. And once we have it here, one of the, one, the important features I wanted to demonstrate is job scheduling. So you can see over here on the right-hand side, we have the schedule tab. And let's say I want to update this pin every single morning. So I can schedule it, select my time zone when I want it to start, and run daily. So it's pretty much all ready to go here, run every weekday, Monday through Friday, or every other day, every day. And that all looks good. Hit save. And now this pin will automatically be updated every single morning at 8.41 a.m. All right, so just a powerful way to kind of improve your workflows, especially if you have data that needs to constantly be updated. You can set up to run using Quarto. You can do this with R Markdown as well, and even Jupyter Notebooks. 
Okay, so coming back to our slides, and apologies if I'm going a little quick here. I know we're kind of only about 20 minutes left, but this is our starting point, all right? So we had our Shiny application, we had all of our analyses and the data within the Shiny application. And what have we done so far? Well, effectively, we've taken the data and moved it outside of the Shiny application. All right, so now the Shiny app, this data is within a pin, with the help of Corto hosted on Posit Connect. So let's move on to our analyses. Now I mentioned previously, there's really only one analysis in the Shiny application, and that is the calculation of this bins variable. So you can see we're using the seek function. It's going to take the min value of the X data, right? So that faithful guys your data set takes the max value, so min and max. It generates a vector of length input bins. So whatever that slider bar is set to, it's going to be that number of bins. So what does this actually look like? So if we have our shiny application right here and we have the number of bins set to seven, all right, we can see this number right here is gonna be set to seven and then we get this vector of right here. It's actually seven plus one. And I'll, I'll kind of explain why here. All right, so there's bins and this example seven computes to this numeric vector. And there's actually eight values here because it corresponds to every single border of these bins. So starting over here on the left-hand side, this left bin, that's numeric value 43. And you have, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to the last side side, which is eight. And those all go again, correspond to this bin vector. Not a very you know, compute heavy uh, analysis, but just for the sake of conversation, you know, what if these analyses were more compute intensive? So you had this massive simulation or machine learning model you're computing. That could take a long time to run. It could leverage a lot of CPU and memory. And what if you wanted to access the results using a different language? So maybe you've created a model, for example, but you want to use your model within Python or Julia or something like that. How could you do that? So we're going to do that using another tool called Plumber. All right? Plumber is a way for you to create APIs using nothing but R code. All right? So if you're like me, when you first started with your R uh, coding kind of journey, the concept of an API was so foreign to me and so scary to me, I didn't even want to touch it. But Plumber makes things really easy. We're going to go through an example here of creating an API. And really, ultimately, what you're doing is taking your normal R code that you've already written and you're decorating it. All right? And I'll show you what those decorations look like here in a second. Um, but the one thing you do need to know for creating a Plumber API is you do need to know how to write an R function. We're going to go over that here uh, now. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to create and publish a Plumber API. So I'm going to come back here to our studio again within our studio workbench. We're going to close out of this Quarto document. I'll clean my screen here using Control L. And let's go ahead and create a Plumber API. So starting with that same star script drop down menu, you can see we have Plumber API right here. So I'll go ahead and click on this. I'll call this NHS. And the goal of this API is to compute the bins. So I'll just call that, and I'll put API here at the end. Make create. All right. So this is an example Plumber API. So similar when you create a Quarto document or a Shiny application using this dropdown, it has some stuff pre-populated in here, but we're not going to worry too much about this stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and delete pretty much all of this except for the library Plumber. There's also this comments up here just for the author. We really don't need those either. So I'm going to go ahead and delete those too. So we're really just starting with Library Plumber. So the first thing I mentioned before is that in order to create an API using Plumber, you do need to write a function. All right. So this function, the whole goal is to calculate the number of bins for your histogram. So I'm going to just create an example function. We're going to call it foo for right now. And we're going to use the function function to create this function. All right, that sounds a lot of functions. So I'm only going to take one argument, and that's going to be the number of bins. And then once you've defined your arguments, we basically open up the body of our function. All right, so we use these curly brackets, and everything, all the kind of the code to compute is going to happen within these curly brackets. The first thing we want to do is I want to obtain that pinned data set. So I mentioned before, we have that pin on Posit Connect. Let's go ahead and access that. Now, before we do that, we first have to connect to um, that board again. So I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to first copy and paste some code. So we're going to library pin. So make sure the pins package is updated. 
And this is basically the same code that we had in our last, uh, um, in the Quarto document. We just wanna make sure we have the connect board registered. And then once we have that, we can read in pinned data. So we'll do that in the next step here. This data set, we're gonna stick with X and we're going to do pins, pin read. Very similar to pin write, but assign pin read. And we're gonna do board. And then we do need to give it the name of our pin data set. So if I come back here to, right here, you can see this is the name of our pin data set. So it's my first name followed by the name we gave it. So I'll go ahead and copy that and pin it here. All right, so that's gonna pull in that pin data set from the pin on Posit Connect rather than pulling it from that built-in data set. Now, once we have that, we wanna calculate, calculate bin breaks. All right, so this is going to be the code which we extracted from that Shiny application. So we're gonna use that seek function and we're gonna find the min value of X, the max value of X, and the length out is going to be um, the number of bins, so n bins. And I just wanna make sure this is numeric. So that's one thing important with uh, um, APIs is sometimes they're fed in as character values. So I just wanna make sure this is converted to numeric. All right. And then we also want to make sure we do plus one. All right, and that should be pretty much it. So let's make sure this works as intended. So I'm gonna go ahead and source this foo function. So if I come into my environments here, you can see the function foo is now in there. And I could try it out down here. So let's say foo, and I'm gonna say seven. All right, I run that, we get a little message here. Don't worry too much about that. But you can see here, we have returned the numeric vector of our bin breaks. So that works out well. So this, is, this function is performing as we intended. I'm gonna go ahead and delete the name right here. So we pretty much have the scaffolding for our Plumber API. Now we just have to decorate our code. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna first give the little syntax here of a hashtag with an asterisk, all right? This is kind of the comments you use to decorate your code using a Plumber API. We use the at symbol here and we already get a pop-up menu of all these various options on how you wanna decorate it. So I'm gonna say API title and we can call it whatever you want. So I'm gonna say geyser, plot or geyser bins API. All right, so that looks good. And then we come down here and I'm gonna give it a description. So this is just helping you or anyone else that wants to leverage your API. So we'll say API description. And we'll say this is going to return vector of bin breaks. The next one we're gonna add here is something called add params. Now I mentioned before in our function, it just takes one argument. This is gonna be our parameters, this n bins. So we need to find what that parameter is going to be. So n bins, and then we can give it a description. So number of bins that you wanna calculate. And then the last thing in is going to be our endpoint. So don't worry too much about kind of the logistics of APIs, but just know that when you call an API, it's calling an endpoint. And we need to define that here. So we're gonna use the get parameter right here, and it's going to be the breaks, right? And you'll see how, kind of what this looks like here in a second. And, and that's it. These are our code decorations. This is what makes our API an API. And what you can see here is similar to a Shiny application. We actually get this button right here to run this API locally. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna make my screen a little bit smaller here. And we're gonna run this API first within our studio. And you'll see we get this uh, Swagger interface, right? and we can try out this API. Now APIs are typically for computer to computer communication. And so that's why we can use a Swagger interface so a human can interact with your API. So we're gonna try this one out. Number of bins, let's go ahead and say, well, I'll say 28. We'll execute it. And you can see it returns in this JSON format. These are all of our bin breaks, all right? So it looks like it's behaving the way we expect. So once that is ready to go and it's working well, we can go ahead and publish this to RStudio Connect just like we did with the Quarto document. All right, so we'll just give this a few seconds to run. And again, it's very similar to when we published Quarto. It's going to capture my environment, like what packages am I using, what versions, the version of R, which I'm using 4.2, you can see up here in the top right corner, and then it publishes it to Posit Connect. All right, and while this is loading, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up. And I'm gonna go ahead and share it with everyone here on the line so you can actually see it. 
So I'll copy this, come into the chat. Now, similar to that Quarto document, everyone here on the line should be able to interact with this Geyser data set or this API. And just to kind of demonstrate that it does in fact work, so I can still come in here. We have our get our endpoint. I can try it out and you can put in whatever number you want here, like we'll say 44, hit execute. It's still behaving as expected. All right, so I'm gonna come back here to our slides and we're gonna kind of try to wrap things up here in the next few minutes. Again, this was our starting point. We had everything contained within the Shiny application, but what have we effectively done now? We've moved the data outside of the Shiny app, and now we've moved the analysis outside of the Shiny app in the form of an API. And so our last little exercise here is we're gonna build our brand new Shiny application. It's gonna ultimately do the exact same thing as that first Shiny app I showed you, but we're gonna over-engineer it a little bit. So the first thing we're gonna do is read in that pinned data set, and then we're going to obtain the bin breaks using that plumber API. And then we're going to just use Shiny, um, you know, within the Shiny code, we're gonna use that same hist function to draw the histogram. So this is gonna be our new Shiny application. So let me come back here, close out of this. I'm gonna come back to that same test app NHS that we created before. All right, so this is our original Shiny application. And I can just run it. It behaves just like before, slides to the left, slides to the right. Well, let's go ahead and over-engineer it using that same workflow I mentioned before. So pretty much everything here in the server function where we generate the plot, we're gonna go ahead and delete all of this and we're gonna plop in some new logic here, all right? This is gonna be where we're gonna you know, put in that pin, we're gonna take, put in that API and then redraw that histogram. So the first thing we need to do is again, grab that pinned data set, all right? So rather than using that faithful, grabbing the second column, we are just going to read in our pinned data set, which again is updated every single day, which is really nice. But again, because we're using pins, we have to make sure the pins package is loaded. So I'll do library pins. And then we also wanna make sure that we register our connect board. So I'm just gonna copy this code again and make sure it's there, all right? So that should all work just fine. So we have our pinned data set. Now we're going to get the vector of bin breaks from the API. Now I'm gonna add in some additional code here, which we haven't talked about. Basically, this is going to be code to call the API. All right, we're gonna use a, another, fun, or another package called HTTR, which is a really great R package for making calls to APIs. All right, so we'll come back down here. I'm just gonna copy some of this code right here and I'll quickly show what's going on. All right, all right. so we're gonna save everything again to this bins function. And really this is the main part you need to look at right here. All right, so we're gonna use from the HTTR package is get function and we're gonna call our API. So I actually need to update this because our API is called something different. So let me come back here and you can see here's the new API. So let me just go ahead and grab this URL and plop that into our API. All right, so we're calling this API and we're gonna query just a single argument, single parameter, and that's gonna be the end bins. And it's gonna take that input from our Shiny application. So that slider bar input, all right? So that's all we need to do there. And then the last thing we need to do is just draw the histogram. I'm just gonna copy this code right here for time's sake here. All right, so drawing the histogram, same thing as before. All right, so this is now our over-engineered Shiny application. We call in our pin data set. We call the API. We use these variables now we've just computed to redraw our histogram. Let's go ahead and run it. Fingers crossed, everything works fine. So it might take a second or two for that API to basically spin up an active R session so that it can compute that data. And once it does that, there we go, we have our Shiny application. Now I can slide to the left, slide to the right, and it behaves just like before. And then what we can also do is just because we've been doing it the whole time, we can go ahead and publish this Shiny application to Posit Connect so everyone here can interact with it. All right, I know we only have four minutes left. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to discuss today. Um, there are a few other things if you want to just you know explore more about improving your workflows. So as a recap, 
what we've done in this uh, presentation is we've over-engineered the heck out of that shiny application. If you don't need to do that, then you shouldn't, right? You always wanna keep things nice, very nice simple, easy to read and for your future self or any of your collaborators, for example. Um, but if things start to get really complex, you have large data sets, updated data sets, modeling, then it's good to know about these tools that can potentially improve your workflows, things like PINs, Quarto, R Markdown, Quart, uh, you know, job scheduling. So keep these in mind. And if you want to learn more, I'll include these slides uh, in a follow-up email so you guys have them. Um, but there is a really great um, page called our solutions page. So you just go to solutions.posit.co. And we have a few other workflows that you can explore, a lot of which leverage the same logic we talked about. So pins, plumber, uh, this one uses our markdown, but you can use Quarto, some other tools in there like Vetiver, for example. And you can see all of the code and everything that goes into them uh, right here. All right, and the last thing I wanted to do is just I wanna share that application with everybody that we just published. So it's just gonna load up here, but while it's doing that, I will come back here and fix. All right, so that's pretty much all I have. Um, I know we have a whopping two minutes for questions. Um, feel free to pop those into the chat. If I can't address them here, then I can certainly do a, a follow-up either session or I can follow up with the email. Okay, I can see there is already a question in the chat from mm -hmm. O regarding, can the PIN server be set up to be hosted on a Dockerized instance? Any cloud can do it, I think. Yep. So yeah, PINS is first and foremost open source. Um, and if you go to the PINS website, which is just PINS, I think it's still our studio.com. So I will paste this here into the chat. It talks a little bit more about all the various types of boards you can leverage. So you can use Connect, you can use um, Dropbox, you can use S3 buckets. Um, and so you might be a little bit constrained to what you can exactly pin to. Um, but for the most part, if it's within a Docker environment and that Docker environment has access to a, a board, you know, where that board, again, be whatever you want to uh, include, then yes, you can absolutely use it. There's no, you know, paid for offering here. It's all open source. Okay. So anyway, it, it doesn't, need, yeah, it doesn't need RStudio server, for example. You can run it using um, the local instance of RStudio as well. Okay, there's also a question on what the plumber package is used for. What plumber is used for? Um, it's good. It's a good question. I'm not sure if I fully understand the context of it, but plumber, um, again, is just a way to create these REST APIs using nothing but R code. Um, so if you're looking to deliver a machine learning model, um, it can be really hard to have folks use your model, right? They wanna actually, they have some data and they wanna use your model to get some type of output. And API is a great way to do that. So you can kind of input your various parameters that goes into that API, and then it can spit out kind of the results of your machine learning model. Um, but there's a lot of great use cases for Plumber. There was actually a really great talk at the uh, NHSR conference about Plumber and some of those good uh, use cases for that as well. Fantastic. Right, we're, we're now up to two o'clock. So uh, all that remains is me to uh, thank you for a fantastic, very interesting presentation. I think you've highlighted um, what fantastic potential R and R Studio continues to have for us within the NHS as part of our workflows. Uh, thank you to everybody who's attended uh, and for asking questions. Um, in the chat, you will find the link to the Mentimeter survey so that you can give us feedback, or you can also uh, give us feedback by uh, joining uh, the website or by tweeting us. Um, links for all of those are in the chat. Um, uh, hopefully you will all come and join us again for next month's webinar uh, on the 18th of January, uh, which will be with Matt Dre from the Cabinet cabinet office who's looking at creating reproducible and accessible spreadsheets using alley tables. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you all for that. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, if you celebrate Christmas have a lovely Christmas and if you're working over the festive period thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thanks.